Assalamu alaikum and greetings everyone. My name is Dr. Akhtar and I am pleased to welcome Dr. Ali Zaidi uh, as our distinguished expert speaker today. He will be giving a talk on an overview of uh, adult congenital heart disease and uh, 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 prospective initiatives. Dr. Saidi is a valuable member of PCHF's cause as he is the chairman of PCHF North America and of course, a dear friend of Mr. Farhan Ahmed's. Dr. Ali Zaidi is currently based with the Mount Sinai Health System in New York. Uh, he is the Associate Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics, the Director of the ACHD Center, the, uh, the Pediatrics to Adult Transition of Care Program, and uh, the Director of Academic Affairs, the Division of Pediatric Cardiology. He is also the President of the Alliance for Adult Research in Congenital Cardiology. Through his leadership, the ACHD Center at Mount Sinai became uh, one of just three ACHA adult CHD accredited programs in New York State and 36, uh, uh, amongst 36 in the United States. Dr. Zaidi is one of only a few selected cardiologists in the U.S. who has five board certifications. He has completed his training from Al Khan University, Penn State University, Hershey Medical Center, and the Ohio State University Medical Center. Dr. Zaidi has held coveted titles as Director of Research at the COACH Disease Program and the Director of the MATCH Disease and Pulmonary Hypertension Program. He has authored several peer-reviewed manuscripts and has been a speaker at national and international conferences. He has also won numerous teaching awards during his career. He has recently, given, uh, he has recently been given a national teaching grant to develop an ACG ME approved ACGHD uh, Fellowship Training Program in New York. Welcome, uh, Dr. Ali Zaidi. Thanks, Emma. Um, let me see if I can share my slides. You can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, so let me just see if I can get this shared. Oh, can you see, is this a presenter view or can you see the actual side? I can't tell. It's the actual side. Perfect. So thanks for the introduction. You know what I'll do in the next uh, 30 minutes or so? I, I know this is sort of being recorded and I believe it's going to be eventually going to go on on, on Facebook Live. The, the, you know, I was asked by Farhan uh, for, and, and yourself so if you talk about adult congenital heart disease and really the, the premise of this next 25, 30 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, is just to sort of take you through a historical journey um, as to what congenital heart disease is um, and what what what's happened over the last maybe 70 years, and then really sort of what lies what lies ahead um, in the field. So I have no disclosures, but and this is really what we'll talk about is this sort of a brief sort of a historical journey. I'll talk a little bit about outcomes, which is really the premise of what we do um, when it comes to congenital heart disease or any sort of um, medical field. I'll spend just a couple of slides on transition, what that means, and then really what lies ahead. So let's start with the beginnings. And I always tell, um, when I talk about congenital heart disease, um, I always tell people that, you know, what this what is congenital heart disease? And, and the concept uh, is it's congenital. You're born with this. So if you go back to even the beginnings of, of of mankind, and whatever, whichever way you want to believe in it, um, it, it, children are born with this. I mean, that's this is the way. It's a, it, it's a defect or a, 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 maybe multiple different defects in the heart when a child is born. So, go back to the beginnings of times. But when did we start hearing about this? Well, I'm going to take you to here, which not that she had it, but it's really Leonardo da Vinci, which is in the in the 1500s, and even before that, people. But there was really nothing at that stage from a management standpoint. Why am I showing Da Vinci is because when you look at his works, it's fascinating because I always say this, I mean, he was not just a painter, but he was an anatomist. And he actually had what in his mind, he visualized what a child would look like in the womb. Um, and in his drawings, he actually had malformed hearts. So this is one of the pictures in his drawings, which, which shows uh, in essence, what looks like anomalous coronaries uh, so, so he even the 1500s, Da Vinci was talking or writing about it. So this must have been from specimens he must have seen. 
In the 1600s in Denmark, it was Neil Stenson. And those of you who are in the medical field might have heard of the Stenson's duct, the parotid. It's in the, in the, in the oral cavity, the parotid gland has a Stenson duct. And he, he's, he's known for the Stenson's duct. But he was the first person who actually described and published a case of what eventually became Tetralogy of Fallot, which was a ventricular septal defect and a malaligned aorta. I won't go into the granularity of it, but the point I'm making is that in the 1600s, there was a sort of a reported case for, for congenital heart disease. Um, and he, as I said, he was really known for the stents and stuff. And then in the 1700s in Glasgow and Scotland, there was this book, which I found fascinating, it was by Matthew Bailey. And the book is called The Morbid Anatomy of Some of the Most Important Parts of the Human Body. So it's called The Morbid Anatomy. And in that, he wrote about transposition or congenitally malformed hearts in the 1700s. Again, people were drawing it, they were talking about it. Um, so this is going back uh, hundreds of years ago. This is Charles Dickens. Um, I know Farhan's not on the on right now, and Farhan will eventually see this. But why am I showing you Charles Dickens? I'm showing you Charles Dickens, not because he had congenital heart disease, but he is in essence, the same sort of thought process that Farhan is, where he was a financier, he was a sort of a, one of the uh, protagonists behind the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital in London. Um, and the reason I'm showing you this is that these are the first children's hospitals that historically started to come around um, in the 1800s. So Great Ormond Street in London, then the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and then Boston Children's Hospital in the late 1800s. So why am I showing you this? Is because this is sort of the first time that children's, heart disease, children's diseases, not just heart diseases, sort of started coming on the map in big cities uh, across, across the world, and this is in the 1800s. But really, when it comes to congenital heart disease, this is sort of where the paradigm was laid, was, was in 1888 by, uh, in, in France, where this was the first time a tetralogy was described, and this sort of became uh, the landmark paper uh, in 1888 uh, where they describe the classical four features of tetralogy of Fallot. And then as, as time went on uh, in, uh, in the early, in the late 1800s, in the early 1900s, this is the, the principles and practice of medicine. So those of us who are internal medicine um, graduates or, or cardiology graduates, we, we talk about Sir William Osler, and he's, he, he is a philosopher um, and a professor of medicine, but he was really known more for his philosophical thinking in the world of medicine and the art of medicine. And his book is called The Practice of Medicine. And in this, in 1897, William Osler actually wrote a five page chapter on congenital afflictions of the heart. So even back then, uh, William Osler, who, as I said, is a philosopher, a scientist, professor of medicine, was talking about congenital heart disease in the late 1800s. And then this is more, uh, as, as time went on, this is here, um, in, uh, in New York, uh, a, a collaborative um, uh, book on, on, on diseases of infancy and childhood. And this is by, by Emmett Holt. And again, historically, um, they were talking about congenital heart disease. And so if you, look, if you look here, it says congenital anomalies of the heart. They had a seven page chapter dedicated to congenital heart disease. But remember at this point, there is no therapies. There's really no surgery, there's no medicines, but we're, people are talking about it. So now we've taken, I've taken you over maybe about 300 years where in different phases, congenital heart disease is being talked about, it's being written about. So if I take you further along, I take, I bring you to Theodore Billroth. Um, and those of, uh, those of you who eventually see this um, are from the surgical field. This is in Germany, Theodore Billroth from the famous um, Billroth operation. Oops. Let me just take you back from the Billroth operation and when Theodore Billroth said that, and at this point there's no heart surgery being done anywhere in the world. And Theodore Billroth said that a surgeon who tries to suture a heart wound deserves to lose the esteem of his colleagues. He was, he was a general surgeon. He says, performing an operation to the heart is tantamount to an act of surgical frivolity. So he said, you know, don't touch the heart. Just, just let it, you know, this is not something surgeons need to do. So when does this all begin? Well, I've taken you through late 1800s into the early 1900s where congenital heart disease is at this point of limited interest. And it's an ailment that's really been described that don't touch it, and not just congenital heart disease, but essentially a lot of heart disease. Uh, it's not compatible with life. And I take you to Montreal, Canada in 1930s, and this is Maud Ad Abbott. And this, she's a, she's a, she was a fascinating woman. Um, and what's really interesting about the historical aspect of congenital heart disease is that it's really um, women, uh, cardiologists, so women, pediatric cardiologists, who sort of 
took took the ball and sort of ran with it. And this was in 1936 when Maude Abbott, Abbott talked about congenital heart disease in Montreal. And she wrote an atlas of the of different forms of congenital heart problems. But again, 1936, she was actually told that um, she shouldn't be practicing, and she was she was sort of told you should just be a pathologist. Um, and it's sort of a um, you know sort of maybe uh, sort of a sad. Um, uh, reflection of times, but she retired when she wrote this book in 1936, um, and then she died a few years later. But this was the first time a whole book was talked about, and then this was uh, sort of for the first time uh, again in London, where um, James Brown uh, wrote a, a, a full textbook on congenital heart disease in the late 1930s. And I find this very fascinating because when you when you look through some parts of it um, and you read through here, you, you see this that this is how these children were being described. That these are blue babies. Uh, they're sheltered in their homes. They're incapable of sustained activity. They're so incapacitated that they can't even walk. Some are retarded mentally because they have not had the opportunity for education. But regardless, all other subjects of great affection from their parents, for any child, probably. But it is peculiar to note that both parents still accompany the child to the outpatient department. And I find this fascinating with those of us who do this for a living from a congenital heart disease standpoint. This is um, there. what you'll see is that we still see this. We still see this happening. Um, um, that you know, patients who are in their fifties and sixties still come with their parents sometimes to the uh, to our clinic. Um, so this was described in 1939 in London. Well, why am I going through all this? Is because how did this sort of field move forward? Well, it moved forward with with congenital cardiac surgery. And so how did that begin? So now we're in the 1930s, and the first time that it was operated on was a patent doctor's arteriosis. So this, if you look at it as a, as a specimen here, and what you're seeing is the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And this is the patent doctor's arteriosis, a small blood vessel. And, and Robert Gross, who was at Harvard in Boston at that stage said, well, we're gonna operate on this in the 1930s. And he basically said, um, we will do this. This was the um, actual picture from the operation. This is a patent doctor's arteriosis in a little bit of an older child who then went on to her 80s. And this was done in 1938. And the fascinating story about this is that Robert Gross, who did this operation, was actually not the professor or was not the consultant or the attending. He was actually a house officer. And he chose to do this um, operation. That was the first time someone had done um, a surgical operation on the heart. Um, as a house officer, he did it sort of behind closed doors, um, and he was actually fired. He was he was said that you know you shouldn't have done this. He was fired. He was still relieved, and then eventually was rehired, and he became the chairman of the congenital cardiac program in Boston. So that was the first time, sort of out of the box thinking, taking risks, not saying anybody should do this now, but but that's how this process started. And the same operation was done in Dusseldorf in the 1930s, but this sort of never made like because um, the surgical records were destroyed um, in a fire in the 1930s. But, and then in the 1940s, Clarence Crawford um, in Sweden uh, with co-actation of the aorta, which is sort of, uh, which is sort of narrowing distal to the left subclavian artery, did a, the first time he did a co-actation repair. But keep in mind at this point that you're not really going inside the heart, you're sort of staying outside the heart. And you're working on the larger vessels, but there's no cardiopulmonary bypass. There is no, you're really working on blood vessels. And in the same concept, this is the landmark surgery that was done in Baltimore by Blaylock, um, Helen Tausig, and Vivian Thomas. And these are the pioneers. These three people here are the pioneers of really what took off as congenital heart surgery in 1944. And this was a tetralogy patient. Blaylock was a surgeon. Helen Tausig was again a pediatric cardiologist who was at Hopkins and Vivian Thomas. Um, was uh, was actually was really the brains behind this. Um, he was a carpenter um, who was working in Nashville, Tennessee. He was working in Blaylock's lab. He wanted to go to med school, couldn't. Uh, Blaylock hired him to work in his lab, and then eventually moved from Nashville, Tennessee, to Baltimore. Which and and, and Vivian Thomas went with him, and they basically came up with a concept that was called the Blaylock Dowsick shunt. Notice it's not called the Blaylock Dowsick Thomas shunt. It's called the Blaylock. Six shunts again, a matter of times, but now now we're sort of moving towards calling it the BTT shunt. But the point being that you can't get blood from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery, so there's there is blockage. You can see these kids are blue, blood can't get into the pulmonary artery, um, and because of this, um, because of this, there is um, uh, no oxygenated blood coming back. So what happens here is that the left subclavian artery is actually transected and brought down into the pulmonary artery. So now you have blood getting up into the aorta, down the 
uh, the BT shunt and into the pulmonary artery so the lungs can get oxygenated. And that was the first time this was done. This was Eileen Saxon. This was actually the operation that was done um, by Blaylock. This is Blaylock here. And this was actually a crowded surgical operating room where people were looking from top down. And this is Vivian Thomas, who was the carpenter who was working in him. And he was telling him what to do in the operating room when he was being operated, when the child was being operated on. And uh, Meryl Harmel did anesthesia. This is Meryl Harmel. And it was, again, a fascinating part of the story is that um, the senior anesthesiologist at Hopkins, um, who was Austin Lamont at that stage, basically said, I will not put that child to death. I'm not doing this case. And Merrill Hamill was sort of the junior person. He came on board and that's how the, excuse me, the operation was done. This is the actual OR report from Blaylock. And I found it very, very fascinating. When you look at what he said, he said the patients did the procedure better than I thought. So he was doing this operation and really didn't, I think in his mind probably was like, well, maybe this will work, maybe this won't. And this is the actual sort of illustration of what, what they had done was um, was in essence, again, they did not go inside the heart. This is sort of the left subclavian artery that's turned down. Um, so the point being that now they were operating on blue babies. And this was the Twitter of, of the 1940s where um, it sort of hit the limelight. Well, that blue babies were being saved and, it, and, and this was being done at Hopkins. And suddenly there was an influx. And in the 1940s, what happened is that once this happened, many thousands of BT shunts were being done. So these blue babies were being palliated. But what people didn't realize at that stage, and eventually people figured this out, was that only 40% were surviving. So even though you were palliating them, they were not surviving long term. So it wasn't even so much 10 years survival. So the question really was, can you actually get inside the heart? But 1940s was really where this paradigm surgery was done. And when you look at the historical elements of 1940s, there's lots of other things that people talk about. You know, you, you, you know there, there, there is uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, there is, uh, um, you know, Gandhi being assassinated and lots of, lots of different things. But there's no mention of congenital heart surgery sort of hitting the limelight. So even though people have talked about it and now you were operating in the 1940s and, and those of you who are listening uh, in, but in, in, not in the United States or in England or in developed countries is that keep in mind, we're in the 1940s at this point in time. But the question then was, can you get into the heart? Can you really get into the heart? Can you do it safely? And that's really where the journey continues. Um, and in the 1950s, uh, the concept of the heart-lung machine comes around and there were 18 patients who were operated. So they opened the chest, they opened the heart, they put the patients in the heart-lung machine. And this was John and Mary Gibbon. They developed what is in the first sort of the concept of the heart-lung machine at that stage. And the first surgery that was done by John Gibbon was actually an ASD closure and a young woman in the 1950s. And this was very successful. So on the pump, uh, on cardiopulmonary bypass, they closed the AIDS. But his next five patients died. And Gibbons actually said, we're not gonna operate. This is it, we're done. We're not gonna go inside the heart. We're not gonna use the, the machine. So then I'm gonna take you to Minneapolis where Walton Lillehei was the surgeon. And in what he thought, Walton Lillehei in the 1950s basically said, this is a patient with technology of Polo. And he said, well, we're gonna go inside the heart. We're not gonna do, we're not gonna palliate with shunt, but we're gonna fix the heart. So. So this was a big surgery that was done in Minneapolis, which really sort of became the hub um, in the 50s for a lot of, uh, of congenital surgery. What was fascinating about this was cross-circulation, um, uh, is that this is, this is the child being operated. Um, and what they were doing is that they were actually pumping the blood through the patient's dad to oxygenate the blood or cross circulate and bring it back. So again, not to belabor this, but what this shows is that this is a child being operated Here's the machine, here's the pump that's coming back and the, and the blood's being pumped back into the child. So the surgical mortality that was quoted by Lillehei in this case was 200%. And I always find this fascinating. So if you, any surgeon who's listening will, will, will sort of, that will ring a bell that even you give mortality at the time of surgery, you say it's 10% mortality or 5% mortality. Here they were quoting 200% mortality because both child and father could have died from this. But, th but this was very successful. So again, the point being that now you're pushing the envelope, you're, you're taking, taking, taking the, the field forward. 50s in Sweden, this is uh, transposition. So this is again, a very complex lesion. Right ventricle should give rise to the pulmonary artery. And here the aorta is coming out. The left ventricle gives rise to the aorta. Here the pulmonary artery is coming out of the left ventricle. So there's transposition of the vessels. 
Um, and they basically um, uh, uh, sending and then eventually Mustard basically said that, well, we're going to do atrial baffle surgery. So we're going to take the right atrium and the left atrium, we're going to baffle the blue and the red blood across. Um, and, and, and the RV is going to give rise to the aorta, but this will be red blood or oxygenated blood that's going to go out. And this was called the sending procedure, the Mustard procedure that stood the test of time for almost for many, many decades. But in the 60s came the concept of catheterization or interventional cardiac catheterization, where in at CHOP, they, for the first time, they said, well, why are we doing, well, not why are we doing, but let's think outside the box. And, and what they did was they put a catheter up into a child in a transposition in the blue baby, and they created an ASD or an atrial septal defect, and then allowed mixing of blood. And the only reason I'm showing this is because in the 60s, this concept of interventional um, congenital cardiac catheterization comes around. And since then, this has really evolved with multiple different devices in the 60s were developed for PDA closures. And again, this is just history that's evolving. In the 1970s, this is single ventricle. Again, I won't get into the granularity of this, but just to show you that in Paris, these single ventricle patients were just dying or they were, they were certainly not being palliated. But Fontan came up with this thought process where all the blue blood from the IVC and the SVC has to get into the lungs and, and because you can't get the blood into the heart for whatever different, different region, this was practice for procedure. But the point being that he created passive right heart bypass. So all the blue blood goes into the lungs directly and then the red blood comes and goes out into the aorta. So think of the thinking of these physicians and surgeons and they basically this procedure is still being done um, sort of with modifications, but it was this, this was done in the seventies. In late 75 was Brazil, uh, Adib Jardim, um, who basically said, well, why are we doing such complex surgery within the heart? If there is, maybe what we can do is if there is a lesion like transposition where the right ventricle is giving rise to the aorta, why are we getting inside and doing such complex work? Let's just transect the big blood vessels and move them over. This was called the arterial switch. And this again was a movement in, in the field. 1970s, I'm sorry, 1970s comes uh, prostaglandin. So those of, those of you who are in the field, prostaglandins was the first time that you could, there was a medical move where you could use a medicine to palliate kids with congenital heart disease, which means keeping a PDA open, a patent ductus arteriosus arterios open. And even now in 2021, this prostaglandins are still being used. I'm going to jump forward and come to the concept of percutaneous valve. This is a melody valve that was done by Philip Bonhoeffer initially in, Par in England and in Paris, uh, where they basically said, well, we're not going to get into the heart surgically. We're going to now replace valves with transcatheters. In 2000, the first time, this was a jugular vein of a cow. They put a transcatheter valve in. So what this means is that I've taken you over, let's say, over the last 300, 400 years and 20 minutes, basically telling you where the field was and where it's going. But then the concept comes as well, what is adult congenital heart disease, right? Well, that's the first time that someone talked about it was in the 70s at the Heart Hospital, the Royal Brompton in London. This was the first time that somebody said this was Lady Jane Somerville in London. And she basically said in 1975 that these kids will start surviving and they, this will become a field of its own and we need to do something about it. So that was the first time a clinic was created. 1977 was UCLA, John Perloff, Joseph Perloff. Mm -hmm. Um, and these were sort of pioneers in the field that back almost 45 years ago said, we need to start thinking now because this will, this will grow. So what this means is outcomes that what, what this basically means is that now we know congenital heart disease is, is, is there. It's always been there. Kids are surviving. The initial outcomes were let's get them to one year or maybe 10 years. But what we know now is that all these kids survive into adulthood. And I'm just going to take two seconds to explain this. This is data from North America showing you in the 60s, this is children with congenital heart disease. The red is adults with congenital heart disease. But look how the circles flip in the 2000 and 2010s. There are now more adults with congenital heart disease than children with congenital heart disease. And what that means is that these children are now surviving into adulthood. This is a congenital problem. It's not acquired. So children will always be born. 1%, 1% of kids born in the world will have congenital heart disease. So what that means is one in a hundred, one kid born anywhere in the world will have congenital heart disease. That kid now survives into adulthood. So we know this. So adulthood is expected. This is what we do in our field of adult congenital heart disease is lots of different comorbidities. There are vascular lesions and arrhythmias and pulmonary hypertension and 
So lots and lots of things that need to be done. I'm going to spend just 30 seconds talking about transition. And this is where the fields sort of transact. And, and just so I can explain, transition means that you're going from a pediatric condition into an adult condition. And that's really what the concept of adult congenital heart disease is, that your child is now outgrowing and getting into sort of the adult world. And that's a process of transition. Why is this important? And, and this is something that we deal with in, 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 uh, in sort of the developed countries is that if we do not transition patients correct, correctly, they get lost to care and there is, they can get sick, they can be more morbidity and mortality. And just to show you, and again, I won't belabor this, this is something that you may or may not have seen. This is a 32 year old with a single ventricle. Everybody should have two ventricles. This is a single ventricle patient who got lost to care, showed up in the emergency room in a children's hospital, a 32-year-old shows up in a children's hospital, sorry, um, and eventually was pretty sick. And this is a blood clot that's sitting um, inside the fontan, which is, again, I won't get into the granularity of it, but, but this patient eventually was listed for a heart transplant. The point is that you're going from pediatrics, you're taking a child with congenital heart disease, and you're moving that into the adult world. And that is the concept of adult congenital heart disease. And this is really what needs to be done across the world. So you're going from a pediatric system into an adult system. And this is difficult because you have to navigate both systems. So it's an operational, this is, Farhan, when he listens to this, he might understand this, that this is, you're getting into the operational part of this where two different systems have to meet. So it's not just the medical care, but now we're getting into the operational arm of this. So what lies ahead? Um, and just finishing up in, in five minutes is really innovation. The field is moving towards innovation where now what we do know is that these patients, we're getting into individualized valves. So most valves in the adult world are percutaneous valves like towers and, and we can do clips. But in the con adult congenital world, we're now developing valves that are unique for every patient. So these are different sort of RV outflow tracts where one size doesn't fit all. We're individualizing it so everybody who's listening has a, their own heart. And we can actually make the model of everyone's heart and then create a valve that is specific to each one of you out there. So there's personalized devices. These are now leadless pacemakers. So those of you who are listening who have pacemakers, they are pacemakers with leads. Now you're these small devices that are in the, sit in the palm of your hand. Again, technology has changed. You can do leadless pacemakers. These are subcutaneous ICDs. There are 3D print models where we can print hearts and we can show the surgeons, we can open them up and we can actually show the surgeon right inside what the heart looks like. This is looking from outside, this is looking from inside. We can actually show them exactly where incisions or cannulas or can go in, so 3D print models. This is 4D flow MRI showing you exactly where blood will flow. Uh, again, this is the aorta and I won't get granular, but this is just showing you where the pulmonary arteries are. So with 4D flow, we can show exactly where blood is going um, so that surgeons or catheter doctors and interventionists don't need to guess anymore. We can show all this. So what is the approach in the developed world? And let me just tell you, and this is now in 2008, 2008. So this is again in the United States and North America is for the first time guidelines start coming out. Guidelines get modified in 2018. Um, and this is important to understand. So again, what I just showed you is that even here in the United States, North America, the, the field has evolved, but it has evolved now that in the last 15 or 20 years, we have, we have now national guidelines, which we did not have before. There's now dedicated fellowship training, which is now two years in the United States. So you have to go through that. And then you have to do a board certification, which means you can't just say I'm an adult congenital doc or I can practice adult congenital heart disease. You have to go through dedicated training you have to go to either internal medicine or pediatrics and you have to take an exam and then you go, you, you become an ACHD doctor. And now the concept of program accreditation is coming in. And again, if Iran listens to this, he'll understand this, that this is the operational arm of adult congenital heart disease is that you have to pick and choose as to what works best in a children's hospital, what works best in an adult hospital and how those two worlds will meet because you can't do this in isolation in one side or the other adult side or the children's side. So this concept of accreditation came in 2016. But let me bring you now, I'm gonna end here in the developing world as to what lies forward in the developing world. And if you look at this, this is what I've talked about thus far in North America. I mentioned places in Europe, um, but this green is really where, where we need to focus on, which is the developing world. Uh, this is from Kentney and this is uh, Amy Verstappen has done some great, uh, great work in, in, in uh, in the field and she's a big advocate and I'm using her name now because she's now chairing Global Arch but 
what I'm trying to show you here is this is North America, this is Australia, parts of Europe. The green is where you have you have uh, less than 10 million uh, per ACHD center. Even in this country, the need is tremendous. We don't have enough doctors. We don't have enough healthcare providers for adult congenital heart disease. But if you look at these other countries that are in pink and red, that's where the problem lies: is that it just isn't enough resources or advocacy. This is where Pakistan is, and this is this is this is where where we're headed towards. Is how do we make this better on a global global scale? If you look here, ten to twenty million per patients out there. Um, Sorry, 10 to, 10 to uh, 20 million people out there per center, and it just isn't enough. So what is needed in the developing world is advocacy. It's advocacy, 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 and that then leads to resource development. Um, and, uh, and we talk about this on, uh, all the time, is that how do we advocate and how do we get the resources? And this is, a, this is challenging. This is again from Global Arts, from Amy Verstappen, who just, just to show you the sort of resources, and this is, this is just the tip of the iceberg is, but what I've highlighted here is that you cannot do congenital heart disease either in children or adults without having the robust infrastructure that is needed. But really the crux of this is gonna be good surgery. And with good surgery comes everything else. It's echo and MRI and GAT, and, but none of this is easy. So even in the developing world, it's, it's, it's tremendously more challenging than it is otherwise. So what this means going forward is if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl, but you've got to move forward. You've got to move forward. And this is where we come with BCHF. Um, this is the vision that Farhan has. And I've, I've, in the last couple of years that I've sort of been working with him uh, here, um, I mean, this is, those of you who have heard about this, I mean, this is a tremendous initiative. And, 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 and I still think that this is something that tremendously needs to be done um, where you have a freestanding, free heart center for children uh, and, and for adults, which again, uh, I, I think is, is, is the right step forward. Um, so I'll end there by basically saying this is the way I've just ran through a journey, a sort of a historical journey to where congenital heart disease is and where ACHD is and what lies forward. I'm gonna end with this, Joe Perloff said in many years ago is that congenital heart disease in adults is the future of children with congenital heart disease. And that really is the crux uh, of what we are trying to do you know, in pretty much any part of the world. So let me stop here, Sam. I know I went over, so I'm gonna hand this back to you. I think I went two minutes over, so I apologize. Back to you, Sam. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen if you want. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Zaidi. That was an absolutely um, uh, mesmerizing talk. And I have learned so much uh, in just 30 minutes. And uh, uh, you have definitely painted uh, congenital heart diseases in a different light because you, uh, as clinicians, as physicians, uh, you uh, are constantly accustomed to hearing about the anatomical aspects of congenital heart diseases, but you, uh, the, the way you portrayed the journey, it, it, it is sort of like uh, humanized the process. So um, uh, thank you for that. And um, uh, so now moving forward, uh, let's go towards the questions. Um, in terms of um, uh, integration of ACHD programs uh, into uh, management of uh, congenital heart diseases, uh, what kinds of uh, things do patients uh, need to consider down the road? Uh, like in terms of uh, quality of life, life mm -hmm. expectancy, uh, resurgery, um, uh, and uh, other aspects uh, that are uh, pertinent uh, for patients uh, who are diagnosed with congenital so, heart disease. Fantastic question, Sama. So, so what you're asking really is um, what should patients um, what should patients expect um, um, from from a CHD or from congenital heart disease surgery? So I'm going to ask that in a couple of different ways. The first thing is um, for congenital heart disease um, in any part of the world, you want the best outcomes. So which means um, operationally, when I say operationally, you want good surgery, you want good post-op care, you want um, good cardiologists, you, got, you want good interventionists, you, you want the whole nine yards. Once you have that all together, once you have all, the, all that together, then comes outcomes, which means so let's say there's a parent or a family with a child with congenital heart disease, you want um, your child to get the best outcomes. So all that that I just said goes into that. Once that happens and the surgery goes well, post-op care goes well, outcomes go well, then comes long-term care. The one thing I'll drive home here is that adult congenital heart disease, and a lot of families make this mistake, is they think that their heart is fixed or was operated as a child. But it, I agree with that concept, but 
over time, it, you can run into problems. So you can certainly, you need long-term care. With that comes a lot of things. As you said, you mentioned one thing, psychosocial care and things along those lines. I mean, there is a lot of um, sort of fabric that is outside medicine uh, and surgery, which is psychosocial care that comes in. Um, so a lot needs to be done. Um, we struggle with it here in, 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 develop, in developed parts of the world. So sort of a, not a great answer to your question, but there are just, it's not a very easy question to answer. Uh, no, thank you. Definitely, it does. Uh, at least, it gives us a directive. It gives us uh, gives patients or uh, people with uh, congenital heart diseases that they have options now. So I think that is, like you said, you know, you you have to start off. You know, if you can't fly, you walk. So I think I think that is a very good initiative. Uh, but um, uh, you mentioned in your presentation uh, that uh, the guidelines for ACHD care they were. Um, uh, presented in 2008. So uh, are these guidelines uh, part of a standard uh, management practice uh, in uh, the U.S. now? Yeah, it's a great question, Tom. So uh, th this is the interesting thing about adult congenital heart disease is that if you think about it, um, 2008, right? I mean, think about it. That's only 10 years ago, 12 years ago, right? But the field, um, the surgical aspects and everything else um, sort of started taking off in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. But quite honestly, we never formalized it. Um, but the guidelines came around in 2008. Those were reformulated and revised in 2018 and uh, 2019. It was led by, um, by uh, several sort of leaders in the field. Um, and those guidelines are now sort of standard of care, which means that uh, physicians or surgeons or healthcare providers in the field should be utilizing those guidelines to guide therapies and management based on the lesions uh, that patients can have. So it's a very detailed document that outlines a lot of that. So you're right. I mean, um, it is now considered standard of care. The same concept applies in, in Europe. Europe has its own set of guidelines. Um, so the European Society of Cardiology has its what's called grown-up congenital heart disease or GUCH. Um, which is done in Europe and in England. And then the Canadians have their own um, sort of guidelines for adult congenital heart disease. So all the big sort of um, um, centers or country, uh, uh, places in the world, I mean, bearded Europe or, or Canada or North America, have their, now have their own guidelines. So in the US, we certainly have to follow that. Um, right, thank you for that. Uh, okay, so we have a, a question from a patient. Uh, I have uh, a congenital heart disease. I've had an operation uh, which is uh, for TOF. So do I have any travel limitations like uh, uh, for airplanes and uh, high altitudes? Um, so it depends. Um, invariably, you shouldn't. If it's a good tetralogy repair, um, again, I don't know um, the details of what everybody's heart condition is, but let's say it's a good tetralogy repair and there's no intracardiac shunting that's left. So, so blood doesn't go from one side to the other and everything looks fine, then there really shouldn't be a problem with flying at all. But if there is um, sort of some sort of defect or some residual defect or some intracardiac shunting that happens, and sometimes we have to be careful um, with, with flying. Um, sometimes there's need for oxygen. Um, so it's sort of, it's hard, it's hard to say, um, without knowing the sort of the granularity of the depth. Uh, but invariably, the take home point is that if it's a good surgery, there's not no shunting, um, oxygen saturations are normal, then yeah, there shouldn't be a, a problem from, from flying. Right. Uh, okay, so uh, we have another question um, uh, pertaining to residual disease. So, um, uh, a viewer has asked that uh, I have had a successful surgery for a VSD. I feel perfectly fine. How often uh, should I go and consult my cardiologist uh, as part of ACHD care? <laughs> so that's a, that's a good question. So, so uh, to do your question before some, I mean, for the guidelines there now, we actually have to follow guidelines. So if, it's, if it's somebody who has an AVSD repair or atrioventricular septal defect repair, then in essence, what we would suggest is that those patients should be followed at least once a year, um, you know, based on how they're doing. Um, if, they are, if there's a problem, they're not doing well, there's arrhythmias or abnormal heartbeats or um, 
or there is concerns for um, either valvular disease or residual disease, they might need to be seen sooner. So every six months, depending on what it is, but I would su suspect that you should be seeing your cardiologist about once a year. Right, uh, okay, so uh, moving on. Uh, you mentioned uh, an interesting fact uh, in your presentation that uh, at present, uh, there are some patients who still actually come in with their parents uh, when, uh, for a follow-up, um, um, uh, for their follow-up uh, with their cardiologists. So what about the role of mental health uh, in uh, ACHD care? Tremendous question. Um, so there is a tremendous need for mental health or um, social workers um, in, uh, the, in adult congenital heart disease. So, I'm, so it's actually, uh, I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, I showed you a couple of slides for accreditation, which means that if you're going to practice adult congenital heart disease in North America, um, you actually need um, a certain, certain sort of um, infrastructure um, to be accredited naturally. One of those requests, one of those sort of hardline items is the need for a um, either a mental health provider, which means a psychologist or a social worker as part of your team. And until that is part of your team, you will not get accredited in the United States anymore. So that is the answer to your question is that how much do we need it? It is needed so much that it is now naturally mandated that you should you need either a psychologist or a counselor or a social worker uh, to be a part of your program. Without that, you cannot get national accreditation. And that in itself should tell you how important the concept of mental health um, is in this field. Those of you, again, and I'll, I'll uh, just take 10 seconds. And just those of you who are listening, who have uh, congenital heart disease or the parents of those children with congenital heart disease, um, trust me when I say this, I mean, children are going to be fine. As I, said, I didn't show you some slide for outcomes and granularity, but 95% of kids in, in the developing world survive, um, which means they get older. And as they get older, they get, go to college, they have jobs, they get married. A lot of these young women get pregnant. They have children. That All that layers into psychology in some ways, and we see this all the time. Um, so... Long answer to a short question, tremendously needed. That is actually a very big step forward and that is uh, something that definitely PCHF is uh, considering uh, in uh, the first pediatric uh, uh, cardiac uh, hospital in Pakistan. So I believe uh, that is all the time we have uh, for yeah, a question. I, I think there's one question that showed up here. I don't know if you saw it, but I think it, there's, uh, there's a question saying how many congenital heart centers exist in India, Pakistan, Malaysia, and other parts of the world. I don't know the exact number. I, I, I can tell you that um, there are not a lot of dedicated congenital heart centers in Pakistan. Uh, I, I mean, there are. They, they don't, please don't get me wrong. I mean, there, there are centers in, uh, in Pakistan, in Karachi. There are in Islamabad and Lahore. Um, but I think the question that was asked is, is there a dedicated um, congenital heart <clears throat> institute um, or a hospital uh, and some of you can correct me if I'm wrong I don't think there's a dedicated congenital heart hospital um, that I know of in Pakistan I think there are parts of other institutions um, as a pediatric cardiology division or but I don't know of any freestanding children's heart center in Pakistan uh, correct me if I'm wrong um, I think there might be one in India um, that I believe is um, sort of being developed. Um, I certainly don't know of Malaysia or other parts of the world. But Sama, tell me if you, you probably know this better than I do. No, in India, you are correct. There is one and that is uh, coincidentally our namesake. It's uh, the Children's Hospital. Uh, again, I'm not aware of Malaysia either, but in Pakistan, uh, a lot of work is being done. But definitely, uh, like you mentioned, mentioned, uh, uh, there is a need for a, 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 a substantial infrastructure. We have the resources and uh, we have, uh, you know, um, uh, the elements uh, of learning. It's just about application and uh, of all of that. So um, I think, uh, hopefully, uh, I have a feeling that uh, in the next presentation about uh, uh, an overview of ACHD, we'll be seeing your name there uh, soon. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And listen, thanks for thanks for having me. And um, again, I, I'm sure our, our 
you know, we'll, we'll talk more as time goes on. And those of you who listen now or who are listening on Facebook or down the road, um, again, this is uh, not a plug so much, but what, what Asama and Farhan and everybody at PCHF is doing in Lahore, um, and those of us who are working with them um, here in North America from PCHF and I mean, this is the step forward. We, we have to do this. Um, it's going to take time, but, but um, you know, so kudos to you all in Lahore. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zaidi. Thank you to all of our panelists, to our viewers, uh, to everyone uh, who uh, tuned into our webinar today. And uh, we're looking forward uh, to seeing you next time. Uh, just some closing words uh, from Dr. Zaidi uh, for any future um, uh, cardiologists who would like to uh, progress their career into ACHD care. Let's, yeah, I mean, if if you want to take um, if you want to train, let me put it that way. In ACHD, um, I'll tell you, it's it, it's a long road. I mean, it's it you it takes a while, um, but it is certainly something that needs to be done. As I showed you that slide, um, there are not enough ACHD providers in North America, let alone the rest of the world. There just aren't. Um, so we need more people. We need more people training in it. So those of you who, are, who want to do it, um, who are committed to do it um, in doing it, um, absolutely, we, you can reach out. Um, I'm happy to help, I'm happy to guide, um, but, but it is much needed, much needed. Uh, thank you very much, sir. But with mentors like you, uh, both on a professional and a personal level, uh, I'm sure the uh, future uh, uh, looks uh, positive. <laughs> so thank you and uh, take care. Uh, and so Allah Hafiz. Well. Well.